I want to invite you back to Titus chapter 2 so we can hook this train up where we left off. Titus chapter 2, if you have it, would you stand? If you're still looking for it, keep your seat. Amen. If you have it, stand. If you're still looking, just keep sitting and I'll wait till you find it. Titus chapter 2, we want to begin with verse 1, and our focal verse is verse 2. Titus chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Reading from the New International Version, it says, You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. That's it. I want to talk about men needed. Men needed men needed I don't care where you go signs are everywhere that say help wanted employees wanted workers wanted employees needed Workers needed. Help needed. All because of COVID. It seems like nobody wants to work. But everybody wants to get paid in full. But nobody wants to work. Good help is hard to find. Just like good men are hard to find. If men were easy to find, it'd be like catching a bus. Amen. Mark Young says that there are five qualities that determine a good man. Responsibility, level-headed, knows how to handle his emotions. He's committed loyal he's a defender and number five he's wild and free and just in case you lose it he doesn't doesn't mean wild like can't control and free like out of control but wild and free as he chases after god amen somebody and he says that these are qualities that you should seek in a lasting relationship and so, sisters, if, if you don't see these qualities, then the relationship won't last long. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22 says, A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. I need you to get that. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. And he's not talking about your children, but your grandchildren. And when you look at it and you check it out and you go deeper, he's not talking about leaving cars, cash, creature comforts, cottages in the country, and Caribbean cruises. He's talking about you've left them a legacy with your relationship with God that when you leave here and you check out of here, they know that you knew God and because of your God, they're following you. Am I talking to anybody? If you're going to leave something for your children, you need to leave them a legacy that you served God while you were here. And so I shared with you last month as we looked at our sisters and talked to the sisters, we talked about building bridges. We talked about bridging the gap. And we learned in this passage that Paul tells Titus, Titus, you teach the older women. And the older women will teach the younger women. And I said that to you because Titus was not married. 
And so Paul told him, listen, I don't want you around them young women. You teach them older women, and then you let them older women teach them younger women. But then he says to him, Titus, I need you to teach the older men. Now, now this, is, this is interesting, and this is what I want to tag this series. My brothers and sisters, it, it's important that we understand fortifying the foundation. What does it mean to fortify the foundation? Because remember, I shared with you that the women ought to be responsible for laying the foundation. But it's the men that ought to fortify the foundation. Let me slow down. I think I missed you. It's, it's the woman, it's the wife, it's the mother that makes sure the children understand that God is the foundation. But it's the father that makes sure he fortifies the foundation because when the children look at the father, they see the stability of the father and they've gotten their instruction from the mother. Are y'all in the house? So I'm looking at the passage. And he says, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. He, he says, you must teach. And so if there's going to be in a fortifying of the foundation, if we're going to create a blockade, if we're going to create a barricade, if we're going to create a wall, we're going to have to understand that that foundation has to be solid. And the only way to get a solid foundation, you're going to have to do some teaching. Mel Robbins says, your past is a lesson, not a life sentence. Forgive yourself and focus on your future. My brothers and sisters, let me say it to you like this. Your mind is a garden. Your thoughts are the seeds. You can grow flowers or you can grow weeds. You need to make up your mind, brother, what you're going to do. You're either going to have some flowers or you're going to have some weeds. And the scripture teaches us how to make sure we get rid of the weeds. In our last series, Women Building Bridges, I said if we're going to build bridges and if we're going to bridge the gap, we must start with the foundation. And I shared with you that in order to build a bridge, one must have piers. And the piers have to go down into solid ground. So then if the women are the piers, P-I-E-R-S, then what are the men? If the piers are what we see above ground, then the men have to be that which is beneath the ground. You can't see them doing what they're doing, but you ought to know that they're there because when you see that wife, when you see that woman and she's standing strong, you know she's standing strong on that husband. Y'all quiet on me. Brothers, you don't have to always be seen, but your presence ought to be known. You catch that on your way home. Brothers and sisters, when you start building bridges, it requires that the piers are built over a body of water and the foundations are made by placing these cassians into the water and they go down till they find solid ground. And then they pour the concrete in. And so when you ride on the Atchafalaya Basin and you see those big piers, you don't see what's holding them up. But I can tell you beneath the ground, brothers and sisters, there's a solid foundation, and that's what's holding up the piers. Can you imagine how many vehicles go across that Atchafalaya Basin on a daily basis? Can you imagine if one pier was to fall? I couldn't help but notice, brothers and sisters, when you're talking about building bridges, the number one killer of children ages one to four is drowning. Our children are drowning because they don't have good foundations. They, they don't have the structure that they need to hold them up. And, and let me say this, every child needs to know how to swim. Let me just say this since it's summertime. Every child needs to know how to swim. Just because you scared of water doesn't mean the children don't need to learn how to swim. 
Every child needs it. It is no, makes no sense for a child to drown. That child ought to know how to swim. Because remember this, they swam around in the amniotic fluid before they ever got here. So they naturally know how to swim before they ever get here. And so when you get them here, the best thing you can do, teach them how to swim. Even though they have on a life jacket, they still need to know how to swim. Did y'all hear what I said? I'll never forget my oldest boy. He said he knew how to swim. He was about six years old. We were at Lake of the Ozarks, and he said he knew how to swim, and he just took off running and jumped in the water. I thought he could swim. So I just sat there and watched him. He just went down. I said, well, he'll get up in a minute. And my wife said, he can't swim. I said, he told me he could swim. He thought he could swim. That's because he'd been in the shallow water. He jumped off in the deep end, and he went down. She had to go get him because I couldn't go help her. I wasn't about to go out there. I, I learned on the high tower once I passed the class. I was just done with swimming. Where I came from, they taught us, you don't fool around with swimming. Black men don't swim well with rocks on their feet. So I learned to stay away from the water. You'll catch that on your way home, too. Our children need to know how to swim in life. And just having a life jacket is not enough. They need to know how to go through the process. Can you say amen to that? Paul says to Titus, Titus, this young Gentile from Macedonia, led to Christ by Paul, he was left in Crete to complete the organization of the congregation. And I said this to you a few weeks ago. He was instructed by Paul to bring about organization, to appoint the right leaders, to exercise his authority, and to teach sound doctrine. Look at verse 1. I need you to see this. Notice this. Titus is teaching the older women so they can teach the younger women. But now he's teaching in verse 2 the older men. It's interesting. Look at verse 2. He's teaching the older men, but then look at verse 6. I want you to see this. It's, it's in your Bible. If you haven't torn it out, look at verse 6. He says, similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. I'm going to come back to that next week. So then now you've got the young men he's going to teach in verse 6, but then look at verse 11. In verse 11, he says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. You see, you have to teach salvation. You have to teach people what it means to be saved. But then look at chapter 3, verse 2. Watch this. He says, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and to show true humility toward all men. See, when you become saved, then you learn how to do what's in chapter 3, verse number 2. But then he also says in Titus chapter 1, verse 11, that I have to teach. Look at verse 11. He says, chapter 1, verse 11, he says, clearly, they must be silenced because they are ruining whose household they are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. He said, Listen, there are two types of teachers: those who teach sound doctrine, solid doctrine, and those who teach false doctrine or weak doctrine. And he says, when there's weak doctrine, that's for their own personal gain. And Paul says, I, I don't need them to be taught weak doctrine. I need them to be taught strong, solid doctrine. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. I read that to you. But then look at verse 3 of chapter 2. He says in chapter 3, in chapter 2, verse 3, he says this. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. So he says, teach again. But then in verse 9, he says, even teach slaves to be subject to their masters and everything to try to please them, not to talk back to them. So not only do he teach, does he teach the women, not only does he teach the young men, not only does he teach the older men, but he also, it says, teach the slaves. Why do you think they didn't want us to learn how to read and write? Because if you learn how to read and write, you're going to read where God says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You can't keep slaves when you teach them how to read. Because there's something about a slave when he learns how to read, he wants to be free. I'm not talking to anybody in here. If you want to be free, baby, open up a book. That's the only way you're going to be free. Open up a book. But then watch what he says. 
in verse 15. Notice it. It says in chapter 2, verse 15. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. You can't have the grace of God without the teaching of God. And when you look at chapter 2, and let me wrap it up with this, verse 15. These then are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with you all authority. Do not anyone despise you. He says, listen, pastor, I don't care what they think about you. He said, these are the things you need to teach. Now, it's not going to grow your church numerically, but it's going to grow it spiritually. Did y'all hear what I said? You're not going to get a crowd preaching this, Pastor Brown. He said, but I tell you what, you will strengthen the crowd that you do have. Because what are we looking for? Men. And men are wanted all over this community. Amen, somebody. So now let's look at verse 1. Let me give it to you. Let me break it down. Now watch what he says. He says teach in verse 1. This is interesting. I need you to see this. The word teach in verse 1 is not the same word that's teach in verse 2. Walk with me. He says, teach what is sound doctrine. That means this is what needs to be taught. Sound doctrine. And then he says, then notice in verse 3, likewise, I mean verse 2, teach the older men. It's the Daskalia in chapter 2, verse 1. But it's, late, it's Laleo in verse 2. Now, you say, well, Pastor, it, it both, they both say teach in English. Yes, but there's two Greek words for teach. And the first one, he says, you have to teach sound doctrine, and that is what you have been taught. And then he says, Laleo in verse 2, he says, because it's what you speak or what you utter when you come to know who has taught you and what you've been taught about. Let me say it another way. He says, here's what you ought to teach and here's who you ought to teach it to. And so when you look at verse 2, it's, it's amazing to me. He says, to talk, he says, to speak, to utter. So when you are taught, then your speech changes. When you're taught doctrine, then your speech changes. Let me slow down. When you're taught what you're supposed to know and who you're supposed to know, once you've been taught that, it shows up in how you speak. Okay. You used to cuss, but now you've been taught better. You stop cussing. Okay. You used to drink, but you've been taught better, and you stop drinking. Did y'all get it? Once you teach sound doctrine, then you help the person to become good and sound. You got it? So it's important for us to recognize that we have to build men before you can build families. And the problem is we are building families with men that haven't been built into men. They're actually grown boys. And you thinking you're going to teach him. How are you going to teach him when God is the one that created him? And if God can't do anything with him, you can't do anything with him. That's why he says teach sound doctrine. So when they know what sound, solid teaching is, then they recognize I got to live up to what I've been taught. Let me blow it down. Let me blow it down. Let me blow it down like this. Watch this. He say teach the older men. Oh, I wish I had more time. He say teach the older men. Can you shout back older men? He didn't say teach the younger, but he said teach the older men. And he uses this word, the same word that we use for presbyteros, which is overseer. He says before they start overseeing a family, you need to make sure they know who's overseeing them. Oh, 
my God, I wish I had more time. If God is not overseeing him and you try to put him at the head of the family, all of y'all going to go into the ditch. All of you going to be tore up from the floor up. He said that brother has to understand that God is overlooking everything that he's doing. And when you don't know God. Okay. Okay. Let me see if I can't break it off to you like this. Let me break it off like this. Uh, uh, I come from the country. And uh, uh, I come from the plantation. And uh, 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 we used to have what they call a straw boss. The straw boss does not own the land. The straw boss does not own the field hands in the land, own the land, work in the land. But he's in the position of overseeing the field and the people in the field. I ain't going to say what you want me to say. I'm going to leave it like that. I'm going to keep it clean. Amen. And, and, and so my, my great-grandfather, his name was El Doom, and, and, and El Doom was the straw boss. And, and El Doom... Would, would ride on a black horse and check out the rest of the field workers. Oh, oh, oh okay, okay. Uh, so my daddy used to tell me, he said, son, I want to get me a black horse. I said, what you want a black horse? He said, because El Doom had a black horse. And, and El Doom used to ride around the field and watch us work, make sure we were doing our work. And I said, well, daddy, why would you want a black horse? I mean, you own the land. You, you own me out here in the field working for you. And, and I used to love it. I loved it. I loved it because he, he would get in his truck and drive to the field and check on me. Brother Holder, he, he'd drive in the field and check on me and make sure I was working. Now, he owned the field, and he owned me that worked in the field. And, and, and he got that from the straw boss, which was his grandfather. And I'm telling it to you, brothers and sisters, because God is overseeing you. And when you don't know how to act, when God leaves your presence, you never know when God's going to show back up. And he want to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. I came to tell you, brothers, God has the ability to be over you, and he's expecting you to be over that family. And if you're not over that family, when he comes back, you're going to have to give account. For what you've done. Let me say it another way. Let me say it another way. Daddy left me by myself in the field. I was driving a tractor. He said, boy, watch that seepless water. I didn't know what he was talking about. He said, stay away from that slough because you'll get in that seepage water. Now, seepage water is water that comes up from the bottom of the ground to the top, but you can't see it on the top of the ground. He left me, and as soon as he left me, I got the tractor stuck. He comes back. He's mad because he told me, watch the seepage water. Here it is. I'm out here. I'm driving the tractor. He hadn't gone 10 minutes. I got the tractor stuck. So you know what I did? I turned the tractor off, went laid up on the tree, took a nap. Came back. He's hot as fish grease. He's mad. He said, what are you doing? He said, daddy, the tractor got stuck. He said, didn't I tell you to watch the seepage water? I didn't know what seepage water was. I know what it is now. Did y'all hear what I said? But here's what got me. Don't miss this. See, I didn't have the experience, but he did. He unhooked the tractor from the disc, drove the tractor out, came in at another angle, hooked the tractor back up, pulled the disc out. Oh, you missed it. You missed it. I got the tractor stuck, didn't know what to do, but my daddy had the experience. He knew what to do. He came back, to unhooked the tractor, moved it, came in a different direction, and hooked it back up, pulled it back out. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. I've lived long enough now to understand when you find yourself in a stuck, just unhook from the tractor, get you another angle, come back at it another way, and come out. I think you missed it. Come back, back up. When you get yourself stuck, unhook yourself from God, come in at a different angle, come back another way, pull yourself out again. God will give you what you need if you know who to go to to get it. I got to get out of here. He said, teach the older men, you can't be overseer if nobody is overseeing you. First Peter, I mean, first Timothy chapter three, verse two. He said, now to the overseer, you must be above reproach. Come a little closer. The husband of one wife. Oh, one wife. Not a side piece wife. You can't have but one wife. 
and no side piece. I know you left home to be with your side piece, but that ain't the scripture. How you going to afford a wife and a side piece? They ain't trying to help me in here. You hear that? They ain't trying to help me. I can't even afford my wife. I can't let alone a side piece. I'm still trying to get some furniture. Okay, I'm going to move on. He said, temperate. Watch this. Self-control, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, able to teach. Watch this. Now, this is for an overseer. Now, we want to shackle this to the preacher. But don't you know that if you're the husband, if you're the head of that house, if you're the man of that house, you're supposed to be the pastor of that house. You're supposed to oversee that house, and you ought to be able to teach the house what they ought to know because you ought to know who the overseer is. Because every overseer needs an overseer. Well, if that don't float your boat, look at Philemon chapter 9. He said, yet I appear to you on basis of love. I then as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. See, brothers and sisters, once you get to be old, you start learning who to be locked up with. Once you get older, you start learning who to be hooked up with. See, you, you don't get old being a fool. Once you get to be old, you got to recognize you got to hook yourself up with God. You got to become a prisoner of the Lord because that's the only somebody that's going to help you be free. That's the only somebody going to help you get out of some of the sticks and stucks and the bogs that you get into. If you're going to get free, you're going to have to hook yourself to Jesus. Here's what I discovered. See, men who manifest the characteristics of maturity. See, men who are mature. See, I'm telling you, just because a man is 45 does not mean he's mature. Just because he's got gray hair doesn't mean he's mature. I'm trying to help you now because the Bible talks about being mature because you know what God says you ought to do. And when you know what God says you ought to do, then I don't care what happens. You recognize I got to stay and work it out because of these kids. They need me. What then, Pastor, are the marks of maturity? I'm, I'm glad you asked. I was down the street a few months ago. I met Miss Jean Butler. You may not know Miss Jean Butler, but she's uh, the mother of Lynn Whitfield. Y'all know who Lynn Whitfield is. Oh, oh, I knew you knew that. I was talking to Miss Butler, and Miss Butler said that her daddy told her, you produce the manners, the marks, and the morals, and I'll provide the money. You produce the manners, the marks, and the morals, and I'll produce the money. Can I paraphrase it? You learn to act like you got some sense. S-E-N-S-E. -S -E. And I'll provide the sense, C-E-N-T-S. Paul said to Titus, you need to promote healthy teaching. See, there's certain behaviors that benefit and come with sound doctrine. And, and some of this stuff that we see our young people doing, that's not because they know better. It's because they have not been taught better. Amen, somebody. You see, when you out of line with the scripture, your life will be out of line. Let me put it to you like this. Your bio plus your behavior equals the Bible. I don't care what your bio says. If your bio does not line up with your behavior, then you're not lining up with the Bible. And see, just because you can put it on paper and it sounds good because you've matriculated here and you've achieved this and you've achieved that, but can I ask you, how you living? Check yourself before you wreck yourself. See, a whole lot of us have a great looking bio, but the bio won't hold up to what God says are the marks of the master's men. When you look at what we studied last month, it was mental for the woman. Watch this. 
But for the man, it's modeling. Let me go back. He said, sisters, it's a mental thing. You got to have your head right. But he says, brothers, you got to model it for it to be right. Because if you don't model it right and your children see it, it's not going to come out right. Can you say amen? So I looked at the text and he said this. Here are the marks of, a, of the master's men. First of all, they exercise restraint. Can you say restraint? Can you say restraint? They know what it means to be restrained. It's not that I can't do it. I choose not to do it. I could slap the taste out your mouth. It's not that I can't do it. I just choose not to. I could drink, but I choose not to. I could get high, but I choose not to. I could leave my family, but I choose not to. You see, you exercise restraint when you're one of the master's men. You could do it because you've got the desire to do it. But you've been taught doctrine. So you got to learn how to stay with it. Amen, somebody. He says you have to be in position to be temperate. You have to know the position that you hold and understand why you got to hold your temper when you're in the position. Let me say it another way. The older I get to learn, the older, the older I get, the, the more I learn how to be temperate, to control my temper. See, the stuff that used to make me fly off the handle doesn't make me fly off the handle as often, as soon. Did y'all get that? See, because once you understand that you're in the position of father, you can't do any and everything because your children are watching you. I'm going somewhere. Y'all hang with me. But then he says, if you're going to have restraint, you've got to be a strong man. If you look at Mark chapter 3, verse 27, the Bible says, how can you take control of a house unless you bind the strong man? Listen to me, brothers and sisters. Hear me when I tell you. If the devil can get you out of that house, he going to run that house. All he wants to do is get you out of the house. If he can get you out, he going to run the house. That's why in order to be a recipient of wick, in order to be a recipient of welfare, you got to keep the man out the house. And they'd rather give you a stipend to keep the man out of the house because they know that that man can bring more into that house other than money. And that's what the enemy doesn't want in that house. I got to move. Look at Mark chapter 5 verse 33. He says they tried to bind him and they couldn't. Let me tell you something. Don't you know that the enemy is trying to bind you? He's trying to tie you up, tie you down. He wants you in debt so that you can't be free. I'm going somewhere, y'all. Watch this. When Jesus comes into your life, no man can ever bind you again. You be careful how you let the enemy tie you down. That you don't have time to be with your family because you are running everywhere. Doing everything but that which you need to be doing in your home. Let me see if I can't make it plain. This weekend, my wife and I were in Lake Charles at the World Series softball games. And, and, and two of our grandchildren, uh, two of our pastoral grandchildren were playing ball. They live in Texas. And, and they were age six to nine. I'm looking at these little kids about this tall. Now, our grandkids is tall, but they, these, little, these other ones little bitty kids. And I'm watching. And then one of the girls says, tell your daddy to text my daddy. Okay, okay, okay. Neither of the girls have cell phones, but their daddies have cell phones. So the one girl says, you tell your daddy to text my daddy, and we'll meet up for dinner. Okay. 
I used to be slow too. So he says, she, they, she says, tell your daddy to text my daddy. So evidently, both girls knew that their daddies had phones. But that ain't what I want you to get. Here's what I like about it. Both girls knew that their daddies knew each other phone numbers. And, and, and so here's what I liked about this. In order for the girls to get together, the fathers had to get together. Here's what I want to give you. Here's what I got from this. You see, if I got God's number and God's got my number, I can send a message to God. God can send a message to me. And guess what? My children will go out to dinner. My children will get the blessing because I know who I need to be connected to. I came to tell some father, you better make sure that you know the right somebody to be connected to so that your children can be connected. But not just that, but then I saw here, secondly, there has to be some respect. He says, worthy of respect. And in order to be a master's man, you have to understand worship. Because when you understand worship, that is derived from your citizenship. So what has to happen is the man has to have a relationship with God, which means he has a citizenship that's not of this world, but it's out of this world. And when you're connected to God, what that does, it gives you the benefit to being able to call God when you need assistance. It's an awe-inspiring quality that draws and not repels. Listen, when you have that God-given ability to worship God, when you're willing to put your hands up and it's not because the police is after you, when you're willing to bow down on your knees and talk to God, that puts you in an area that other men cannot come into because they don't understand you are a citizen of another country. Let me see it another way. When you're serious about your relationship, brothers, this is not a plaything. This is not something you do on Sunday. This is not something you do on Father's Day. This is something you have to do every day. And failure is a part of it. And I've discovered failure is a true test of your greatness. Abraham Lincoln failed eight times at public office. Eight times. He failed twice in business. And he had a nervous breakdown. Y'all miss what I just said. Eight times, public office failed. Two times, failed in business. And had a nervous breakdown. But I believe it was Abraham Lincoln that saved the nation. You'll catch that on your way home. I believe it was Abraham Lincoln that helped us to be able to celebrate Juneteenth. Did you get what I just said? Brothers and sisters, now he failed eight times in public office and two times in business and one time he had a breakdown, but guess what? God was not done with him. He still became president. He still gave the Gettysburg address. He still made a difference. Don't let failure define your life story. You're going to mess up. You're going to fail. You're going to miss it sometime. But I came to tell you, if you are connected to the right somebody, he has a way of picking you up when you fall down. So what? You made some mistakes. Everybody has made mistakes except Jesus. Amen, somebody. It was Abraham Lincoln who said, great men are ordinary men with extraordinary determination. You got to have some extraordinary determination if you're going to make it in this day and time. You can't let all the stuff that's bothering you mess you up. So what you fail? Get up and go after it again. Here's what I discovered about myself. I'm gifted, but I've got some gaps that I still need to fill in. I'm a man of faith, but I also have some flaws. I'm in a relationship with the divine, but I also have some defects. Brothers and sisters, I'm blessed, but I also have some blemishes. I have a word, but I also have some weaknesses. I'm anointed, but I also have some infirmities. I'm led by him, but I also have a limp that every time I walk sometime, I limp when I walk. 
I strive for perfection, but I still have some imperfections. I'm saved, but I still got some stains in my life. But I'm not going to let that stop me. Why, Pastor? Because I know I got to have the right response. Look at what he says in that text. You got to be self-controlled. You got to be sound. You got to have understanding. You, you got to understand that you are free. And you have control over your passions and your desires. You're free to do it, but you're controlling your passions and your desires. You have to be sound. What's sound? I'm glad you asked, Pastor. You got to be healthy. Healthy in your faith. You may not be healthy in your lifestyle, but you got to have health in your faith. Am I talking to anybody? Sound in your faith. You, you got to know you can win over. You can persuade other people. You have a practical faith that you are constantly living out. But then he says you got to have love. You got to have esteem. You, you got to cherish the relationship you have with God. To regard with affections. But then he says you got to have endurance. Huh. I like this. You got to have endurance. In other words, you can't be worn out. You get tired, but you can't be worn out. Am I talking to anybody? You may want to give up, but you can't throw in the towel. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Say, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into the grace in which we are now standing. And as we rejoice in the hope of the glory, not only so, but we also rejoice in our suffering. Oh, if you're going to be a father, you're going to suffer. You're going to go through some stuff if you're a father. But I came to tell you, brothers and sisters, suffering has its rewards. Because he says it produces perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. He said, in other words, if you don't give up, and you hold on to your hope, you're going to make it through. I got to leave you here. But it says in Romans 15, 4, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scripture, we might have hope. You see a pattern here, don't you? First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, we continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, brothers and sisters, you got to have hope. I know it seems hopeless. I know it seems like we won't make it, but I came to tell you, I know God that when I'm out of hope, he's full of hope. Can you say yes? Brothers, how do you respond to life? How do you respond to the pressures of life? How do you handle the problems that you come up against? How do you deal with difficulties when you're trying to do the best that you can? My brothers and my sisters, I came to say a word of hope. God is looking for some men. He needs some men that will not get weak under the pressure. He needs some men that will stand flat-footed and tell the devil, you can't come in this house. He needs some men that will stand flat-footed and say, for God, I live. And for God... I die. I feel my help in here. Brothers and sisters, while I was watching these little children play softball, when they make a mistake on the field, if they strike out, they throw the bat down. If they get thrown out, they take their helmet off, throw it on the ground. If they make a mistake, I'd see them cry. I'd see him fall down 
on the ground. But I would see the fathers run to their daughter's rescue, pick their daughters up and hug them and kiss them and tell them it's going to be all right. Have I got any witnesses here? I watch the girls show emotions. I watch them crying. I watch them throwing temper tantrums. But I watch the daddies grab their daughters and hug them and rock them and kiss them on the forehead and tell them it ain't nothing but a game. Have I got any witnesses here? I came here on Father's Day to tell some father, grab your children, hold them real tight, squeeze them real tight, kiss them on the forehead, pat them on the head, and tell them it's just a ball game. Life is better than a ball game. You got to learn how to pick yourself up. You got to learn how to shake yourself off and get back in the game. Can you say yeah? Can you say yeah? I'm going to leave you here, but I got something else to tell you. I watch these little girls. They come out the dugout. They put the little apparatus on their back and they practice their swing. I watch the little girls. They'll walk to the base, put the back behind. Do all kind of gestures. And then I watch them get to the plate and they hold their hand out like this. And that's to tell the pitcher, don't pitch just yet. And then I learned they hold their hand back to the umpire and they tell the umpire, I'm not ready yet. Can I get a witness? And they get to the plate and they get their legs right and they get their back right. And I watch them and they take a few practice swings. And they get up to the base. Have I got a witness? And the next thing I know, they'd hit the ball. And I get a witness. And I was standing there in utter amazement. These little bitty girls could hit the ball way out into the field. Have I got a witness? I'm almost through here. But I got to tell you this. And I watched the girls and the ones that were real fast. They'd be off the base doing like this. Go back to the base. Get off the base. And I watched them. And the girls that were fast, they were stealing the base. Have I got a witness here? Y'all looking at me like you don't understand. They're six and seven years old, but they know how to bat. They know how to give signals. They know how to hit the ball, and they know how to steal bases. I came to tell somebody, I don't know what you teaching your children. I don't know if you're spending time with your children, but I came to tell somebody, you better tell them there's more to life than a ball game. There's more to life than swinging a bat because you got an enemy called the devil. And what he's trying to do is strike our children out. Can you see? Yeah. I say, can you see? Yeah. I came to tell somebody we can't let our children strike out. We can't let our children make a mistake. We got to teach them the rules to the game. Can you say yeah? Can you say yeah? I'm going to leave you when I tell you there's one rule that every parent ought to know. Can I tell you what it is? train up a child in the way he should go and when he gets old he will not depart 
Can you say yeah? Don't fool me now. Can you say yeah? Is there anybody here that can testify? When I was a little child, I went to Sunday school. I went to Bible study. I went to vacation Bible school. And here I am now. I'm grown. I'm still going to Bible study. I'm still going to vacation Bible school. Can you say yeah? Can you say yeah? Is there anybody here that can testify? You can give on your feet and tell somebody the pastor is telling the truth. You need somebody that's going to guide you and teach you the right way. Ain't it all right? All right. Can you say yeah? Just wave your hand and say, Pastor, I hear what you're saying. God is looking for some real men. God needs some real men. And just in case you don't know how to become a real man, I got one witness. Is there anybody here that knows God had one son? He sent him to Calvary. He died on a Friday night. Stay dead all night Friday. Got up Saturday morning. He was still in the grave. They checked Saturday evening. He was still in the grave. But early Sunday morning, he got up from the grave. And I came to tell somebody, ever since I met Jesus, I've been going in different circles. Ever since I met Jesus, I've been walking with a different crowd. Ever since I met Jesus, I've made some mistakes. I've fallen along the way, but I'm glad he picked me up. Is there anybody that can testify? He picked you up. Is there anybody? I said, is there anybody that can testify? He picked you up. Is there anybody that don't mind testifying? He picked me up, and I'm glad, I'm glad he picked me up. And every since then, every round has taken me higher, higher, higher. Can you say yeah? Yeah! Yeah! yeah. looking for some real men that'll stand up in a worship service and tell everybody I serve a risen Savior. He's in this world today. He needs some real men that don't mind worshiping and crying and showing emotion because you understand. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, I wouldn't be what I am. I watched my grandbabies this weekend I was happy to see my grandbabies. I married their parents 18 years ago. And to see those babies grow up and to see them playing ball made me happy. But let me tell you what made me happier. Hearing them say, Grand Pastor, how have you been? What you've been doing? That's what makes me happy when they call me Grand Pastor. Because when God helps you to make a difference in somebody's life, they become your children. And when they make a difference in, when you make a difference in their life, they make a difference in your life. And Smokey Norfolk sings a song. And I love this song. He says, not a second or another minute, not an hour or another day. But at this moment, with my arms outstretched, I need you to make a way. As you've done so many times before, through windows or an open door, 
I stretch my hand to thee. Come rescue me. And he said, I need you now. I need you right now. But here's the verse I really love. If I never needed you before, to show up and restore all of the faith that I let slip while I was yet searching the world for more, the truest friend I have in me. You're my best friend, I know in me. I stretch my hands to thee. Come rescue me. Come right away. Brothers, if you don't get anything else, when you think you can't make it, you just say, Lord, I need you now. I need you right now. Not another second, not another minute, not another hour. I need you now. And I promise you, he'll show up. And he'll give you the strength that you need to do what you need to do. Men are wanted in the service of God. He wants you. And he already knows you're not perfect. But he wants to use you. But you got to be willing to let him use you. I want to extend this invitation.